story, our, our, our look at the book of Acts. And we're up to chapter 13. We did chapter 12 last week, and we're doing chapter 13 today. And in chapter 13, we, we, we discover, if, if you've read the book of Acts, that the first missionary journey takes place. And Paul and Barnabas, they are sent out by the Gentile Antioch church on the first missionary journey. And they go, they follow this particular path where the arrows are. And they head off from Antioch to the right of the picture. And they go to a place called Seleucia on the island of Cyprus. It's the first um, stop they make. And after spending time there preaching, they go to Paphos on the right hand side, or sorry, yeah, the right hand side of the, um, of the island of Cyprus. And then they go to a place from the island of Cyprus or Paphos to the Bible tells us to a place called Antioch in Pisidia. And there Paul preaches a really good sermon to the Jews there, the people he's trying to reach, and also to the people who are called proselytes, who people who are Gentiles, but they practice the Jewish religion. And Paul's sermon to these people in this place called Antioch and Pisidia, you can see it up there in the center of the screen. He's, it's so impressive that this is what the Bible tells us what happened as a result of preaching. And as we can see, this is what it says in Acts 13, 42. The result of Paul preaching to these people. Verse 42 says, As Paul and Barnabas were leaving the meeting, the people begged them to stay more about the same things on the next Sabbath. What Paul was saying to these people was really interesting. After the service, many Jews and a lot of Gentiles who worshipped God went with them, and Paul and Barnabas begged them all to remain faithful to God who had been so kind to them. So obviously some people had been converted to Christianity. Sorry. And the next Sabbath, Verse 44, almost everyone in town came to hear the message about the Lord. So there was a revival taking place and good things were happening in this place called Antioch and Pisidia where, 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 where Paul and Barnabas were preaching. But something happened. It says in verse 45, this is the verse I want to concentrate on today. When the Jewish people saw the crowds, they were very jealous. They were very jealous. Now, jealousy is never a good thing. I don't know if you've ever noticed this take place in your home. One kid gets jealous of the other kid. Now, the Bible gives us a few reasons why we should never, ever fall into the trap of getting jealous. Come on. To the person next to say, jealousy is bad. Jealousy. It's very bad, isn't it? But these Jewish people, they were jealous of Paul and Barnabas. Now jealous, now jealous, there's a couple of reasons why the Bible tells us jealousy is not good for us. First of all, jealousy is bad for your health. Because the Bible says in Proverbs 14.30, A sound heart is like life to the flesh, but envy the rottenness of the bones. A sound heart is the life of the flesh, but envy or jealousy mm -hmm, is the rottenness to the bones. Now, a quote, I found this on the internet yesterday. It says, don't worry about the people who aren't happy for you because they probably aren't happy about themselves either. Yeah. Isn't that true? People get jealous. Someone said a jealous woman would do, does better research than the FBI. Anyway, yeah. here's, another, here's another point. Now, jealousy is also bad for your spirit. Yeah. It leads to sin. Now, if you look at the story of Cain and Abel, now Cain, the older brother, was jealous of Abel because Abel had favour with God because he gave a better offering, he gave a better sacrifice, and Cain got jealous. And because Cain got jealous, the Lord noticed that and says to, and says to Cain the following thing, what's wrong with you? In Genesis 4 verse 6, the Lord said to Cain, what's wrong with you? Why do you have such an angry look on your face? And verse 7 says, if you had done the right thing, you would be smiling. But you did the wrong thing. And now sin is waiting to attack you like a lion. And sin wants to destroy you. But don't let it. Now the sin of jealousy led to murder. Isn't that right? Yeah. And jealousy has been around ever since Cain and Abel, to be honest. Now jealousy even takes place in my family, believe it or not. 
Yeah. Even notice, we've got, we've got some dogs here this morning. Even, even, even notice dogs get jealous of kids. Have <laughs> you noticed that before? A new baby comes along with the family and the dog gets jealous of the, fa- the dog gets jealous of the baby. It's interesting. So, I mean, yes, I mean, it's, it's, it's an interesting concept, isn't it? But I remember when, when Alan was born, one time, Daniel, you don't know, remember you said this, but you accused your mother once of saying that you love, that he, she loves Alan more than she loves you. You were jealous. You don't remember that, do you? I'm just embarrassing you now. <laughs> but the same thing happened when Timmy was born. When Timmy came along, I know that Alan was very, very jealous of Timmy because kids get jealous, don't they? They do. Kids get jealous. Pets get jealous. It's something that we all do from time to time. Now, don't think that adults are exempt. Now, if you're like me, you never do this, okay? I'm sure you never do this. When you post something on Facebook, immediately someone else posts something on Facebook as well. There's almost like a Facebook competition takes place between one person who wants to post something better than the other person and you see what someone else has posted and you think that person's got such a perfect life and you get jealous. No one does that here, do they? Nobody does that here. But it's true, I think a lot of people post things on Facebook and and when you see someone else having this perfect holiday or this perfect life or going to a perfect restaurant and you're stuck at home with the kids, you never get jealous, do you? Of course you don't. It's just me who does that. Now, now jealousy is, is, is an interesting thing because non-Christians can be jealous of Christians. They really can. Now, there's a verse in the Bible that I found really interesting about Jesus the other day. It says in Luke 2, verse 52, it says, And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favour with God and man. Now, who knows... That when God's favour is upon you, that can be a blessing. Isn't that right? It can be. But let me me say this. Favour can also be from time to time a burden because when God is favouring you and he's not favouring someone else, they will see you and they will get jealous. And not everyone is going to react favourably to God's favour on your life. We should be seeking for God's favour. We should be searching and we should be asking God for it. But it, sometimes it comes with a catch. And the people, and the Bible says that you know, Jesus had, had the favour of God on him, obviously. But also when you think about it, a lot of people were jealous of Jesus. And one of the reasons why he got crucified was because the religious leaders and Pharisees were seeing that more people chose to follow him. He was taking away their power base. They got jealous. And so one of the reasons that they, that was one of the reasons why they crucified him. Favour can come with a burden because people can get jealous of you. They can get jealous of you. But you know what? And I'm sure no one here has ever experienced this before. No one here has ever felt this before. I'm just putting my tongue in the side of my cheek. Uh, 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 Okay? Because, I'll be honest with you, Christians can sometimes get jealous of non-Christians. The Bible says, Proverbs 23, verse 17, Solomon, one of the wisest men who ever lived, he noticed this. Don't be jealous of sinners. But always honour the Lord. And I think sometimes that's an issue for us. Now now Solomon wouldn't have written written this if he didn't know it was true. Sometimes people who believe in God, we get jealous of people who don't believe in God because it seems to us that they're in a better position than we are. And we get jealous. Come on. Now I remember when I was when I, when I was in, I was in my mid twenties and I came, and I just finished a year of Bible school. I wanted to serve the Lord, and I knew God had called me to the mission field. I knew that, but it took me three years from finishing Bible school until I finally got there. So there was three years of a bit of, of a bit of wandering, a bit of a bit of a journey that I had to take, and it was really weird because I knew I was called to serve God. But what was really strange was because I knew I was called to serve God, but things weren't quite opening up for me fully. You know, when you when you want to serve God, when you want to live for God, His will for your life is not always opened up totally. It takes a bit of a journey for you to get there. And I saw the journey that I was taking to get there, and I was comparing 
the opportunities I was missing out on, the money that I could be making, but I wasn't making it because I had this desire in my heart. I wanted to serve God. And opportunities were opening up for me as, 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 a, as a guy in my mid-20s to teach scripture in high schools and and um, and, and do, do other things. And whenever I tried to apply for a full-time job, I couldn't get it. Mm. I remember once I, I went to a big office in North Sydney and I was applying for a job as a fire technician and I sat on the chair and I was so nervous that I fell off the chair. I leaned back, the guy said to me, relax. And I relaxed too much and I fell back on the chair and I fell on the floor. And just, I just couldn't get, I just, a door for, you know, for getting a full-time job, I just closed. I just couldn't get one. But all these opportunities for ministry for what were opening up for me. And to be honest, I was getting jealous of people who had partners. I was getting jealous of people who were, who were, who were, who were, who were jobs and, and that they seemed to be set on. I was just wondering a little bit. So I was trying to fulfill the call of God in my life. And I got a bit jealous. But that's all right. You know, the Bible says sometimes, it says in, in Luke uh, 9.58, it says, And Jesus said to them, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Sometimes it's like that as a Christian. You feel a bit unsealed sometimes because God's will for you hasn't been totally revealed. And you might get a bit jealous of those who do seem settled. But I want to say this. Even though Christians have the capability the capacity of being jealous, mm. they are also capable of experiencing joy. Mm. Isn't that right? Mm. Because it goes on to say in Acts chapter 30 verse 52, verse 45 talks about the Jews who are jealous. The jealous Jews. But then there were the followers of Jesus. Well, and it says in Acts 30 and 52, it says the disciples, the people who came to Christ in that particular city, they weren't filled with jealousy. The disciples were filled with joy yeah. and with the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Now, I don't know about you, but I would prefer to be full of joy yeah. instead of jealousy. Anybody wow. with me on that point? Wow. Just, just raise your hand. Give me a little yeah, bit of... I mean, kind of Join us. Stop that boring. Come on, stop yawning, okay? Come on. <laughs> we are capable of experiencing joy, yes. but yes. we are also capable of experiencing jealousy. Yeah. We are. Now, David wrote the following about envy in Psalm 37. He said, don't be annoyed by anyone who does wrong and don't envy them. Yeah. They will soon disappear like grass without rain. Mm. Trust in the Lord. Live right. The land will be yours and you will be safe. Yeah. Do what the Lord wants and he will give you your heart's desire. Yeah. Let the Lord lead you and trust him to help. Then it will be as clear as the noonday sun that you were right. Be patient and trust the Lord. Don't let it bother you when all goes wrong for those who do sinful things. Easier said than done, but it can be done. Amen. Amen. And if it's true what the Bible says, don't let it bother you. When people seem to be going better for doing the wrong thing, we can still choose joy over yeah. jealousy. If there's a band, a, a Christian band that are very, very popular called King and Country. Some of you may have heard of them. Yeah. Now, one of the songs that they that they sing which was a number one hit in America and it was a number one hit in the, in the Christian scene here in Australia was a song called Joy. Yeah. But it's a good song by, this, by, this, by these two brothers, Joel and Luke Smallbone. Originally Aussies, but they moved to America with their family. We need to choose joy. The Jewish people saw the crowds, they were jealous. Acts 13 45. But the disciples were filled with joy. How do you choose joy over jealousy? How do you do it? I thought I'd just do a bit of a comparison between what jealousy produces in comparison to joy. Jealousy produces comparisons and joy produces contentment. Now, one of the reasons I think that Paul and Barnabas were, and that these people following them, and the Jews were jealous of them, probably the Jewish synagogue leaders were jealous of them, was because Paul and Barnabas had something that they didn't have. They were losing their power base. These proselytes, these Gentiles who wanted to follow God, 
through the Jewish faith when they realized they didn't have to follow 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 God through a whole bunch of works, but they could follow Jesus through because they were saved by grace. And, and, and because the Jews realized these proselytes weren't following them anymore, they got a bit upset. Losing their power base, losing their money, losing their ties, losing this, that, and the other. And so, you know, a comparison was made between what Paul and Barnabas had and what they didn't have. That's what jealousy causes. Comparisons. You have a red hat on, but I don't. You're jealous. But when you're joyful, yeah. you're content, aren't you? You're content with your station in life. You're content with your possessions. You're not keeping up with the Joneses. I don't have anybody called Jones who's my neighbor, but you know what I'm talking about, don't you? Amen. You're content with what you've got. You're content with what you've achieved, and you don't live in regret or disappointment. You are content. The Bible says in Philippians 4 verse 12, I know what it is to be poor or have plenty, and I've lived under all kinds of conditions. I know what it means to be full or to be hungry, to have too much or too little. God gives me the strength. Christ gives me the strength to face anything. Yeah. Now, what, now, I want to say this. You know, I've met Christians. And, you know, I met one guy once. He was retired. I, was, well, I, did, I, did, I did a small job for him. And another guy came and they were talking. I was putting up a ceiling fan and I couldn't help but overhear the conversation. He was saying, look, I feel so content. I'm retired, but I'm not striving. I don't need to, I mean, I'm just so happy, grateful for what God has done in my life and what God has done through me. Wow. wasn't striving. And whether he was in a good place or a bad place, he was content. And Paul was such a Christian. And there were times when Paul's life was going pretty well materially. When Paul was, in, it says in Acts chapter 28, when, when, when Paul was, was, was in Rome, he actually lived in his own rented apartment and life was pretty good. He didn't spend all of his time in troubles and woes and tribulations. There were times when Paul was doing all right for himself. But of course there were other times when he did spend his days in a dark, dirty, grotty, dingy dungeon. But it didn't matter to Paul whether he was in a dirty, dark, grotty, dingy dungeon. Whether he was living in a nice in a nice apartment, it didn't matter to him. Because he could do all things through wow. Christ who strengthened yeah. him. And we've got to have that attitude. We've got to have that attitude. Yeah. Now, you know, if, if I think I've got a miserable life sometimes, and I don't, okay? Amen. But I'm not going to compare myself to other people. I mean, now, Shino did communion this morning. Now, I went over to Shino's place because he needed my he needed my presence in his apartment to be a witness to a signature, to a, to a document that he had to sign. And he is a pretty good cook. He gave me garlic prawns for dinner. He sent me a little text saying, dinner will be provided. And he gave me garlic prawns. He gave me garlic bread. He gave, I don't know, what else did you give me? He gave me some satay meat on a stick. And it was, it was a lovely, lovely meal. Now, my culinary efforts in the kitchen are nothing compared to this guy. I taught my, well, my mother taught me how to make stew before I left home. And that, that meal lasted me for about four years. I had the same thing every day for the last four years. I've got to learn how to make casserole. From 1999 until 2002 when I got married. Thank goodness for that. I lived on casserole for three years after that. I mean, I am not a good cook. I'm not. But this guy is. But I want to say this, mate. I'm not jealous of you. Yeah, come on. I'm not jealous of you. Just invite him for another meal. Yeah, just invite him for another meal. It'll be even. It'll be even. Because I know there's some things that I can do that others can't. Yeah. I was working for a lady on Friday, and she had a she called it, she called it a first world problem. A first world problem was she didn't have enough lights in the bathroom to put a makeup on in the morning. Oh. She called it a first world problem. So I put up these two Hollywood lights, one each side of the mirror was going after five hours of struggle, running these cables and drilling through tiles and doing this, that and the other. And, and I finally got it done and I looked at it and I thought, wow, that's, I, did, I did a pretty good job, Mike. I did drill a little small hole through the tiles that I shouldn't have drilled, but, but she didn't notice that, thank goodness. But anyway, <laughs> but apart from that, it was a good job. And I, and, I, and I was content because, you know, 
God's given me things to yeah. do. Yeah. That only that, you know, other people, maybe other people could do it better than me. But, you know, God's given me experiences and skills and, 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 yeah. and, and life. That, that's good. You know, I don't compare myself. And because I don't compare myself, I'm content. Preach. I'm content. Here's another point. I've got, to, I've got to go quick. But jealousy produces careless speech. And joy will always produce consideration. Always. And the Bible says about these jealous Jews, how it says in verse 45, it's got it highlighted here in bold, they insulted Paul. Now, in another version, this is the contemporary English version, but the, the modern King James version says this, they contradicted those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Now the word blaspheme means this, it means all derogatory speech. You want to speak bad of somebody, you will say something and you don't care what you say. Even though it works sometimes, some people might use God's name in vain. They don't know what they're saying, they don't care what they're saying and they're using God's name as a swear word. Not good. Now, there are, there are times in the Bible when people blaspheme, when they use God's names, God's name in a careless way. Goliath blasphemed God before David put a stone in his forehead and killed him. And, and, but let me just say this, when someone is jealous, very often that's characterized by a carelessness of speech. They will lash out, won't they? And say things they regret later on. You ever noticed that before? Someone's jealous. You don't care what they you don't care what they say. You know, and, and, and it's true. Boys can get, you know, boys can be living with their single mums for years, getting all their mother's affection. Mother finds somebody that that, that male becomes a stepdad. The little the teenage boy might get jealous of the stepdad because suddenly the mother's affection is on is on the, is on the stepdad instead of him, and you know, and he, and he gets. And you've got to work through those problems as a family sometimes, don't you? You do. But what I want to say this, I mean, you know, I mean, my son, Alan, he's got a bit of a temper at home. He's in Sunday school, he can't hear me. But, you know, <laughs> I, you know I sat down with him the other day because he just lashes out. I don't know why, he just, he just gets upset for no reason. And I says to him, look, you know, the Bible says in Proverbs 16.32, greater is he yeah. who can control his temper than he who can take over a city. And so I spoke that to him at the dinner table. Yeah. Did he understand me? Did he get me? <laughs> no, he didn't. Now, you've got to watch yourself, mate, because you deliberately stir your brother, don't you? Uh, the, the, to get him upset, ball, ball, because you know it's so much fun, isn't it? Yeah. But you've got to be, you know, I mean, it's a slight thing, isn't it? People just lash out, they don't care what they say sometimes, and it gets them in trouble. Yeah. But I want to say this. Come on. A person who is joyful Come on. is considerate with their speech. Yes. They are. Now the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12 verse 2 it says, Had Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. When Jesus was carrying the cross on his back where they nailed his hands and feet to the cross and he was suffering up there for a few hours. I mean, he wasn't smiling. It was agonizingly painful for him. But he was still full of joy. Yeah, and the on. reason why I know he was still full of joy, because A, the Bible says, but also he was considerate in what he was saying to people, even when he was having his own problems up there on the cross. Yeah. Now there are seven, seven sayings of Jesus in the Bible, things that he said when he was crucified. Now three of them, are to do with being considerate to people. He's up there on the cross. Praise to Father God. Jesus, God, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Yeah. Considering other people who didn't know what they were really doing. Yeah. Thief on the cross. Concerned about his eternal welfare. Concerned about the destination he was going to go to. Mm. Jesus was considerate to him, saying, Look, I say to you, you're going to be with me in paradise. Be considerate of somebody because he's full of joy. And he sees his mother. His mother's grieving and she's probably grieving because she doesn't know where, 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 what the future holds for her because 
her older son who's supposed to look after her is, 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 is almost dead on the cross. Sister John, look. Look after my mother. Sister Mary, look. This is now the person who's going to look after you. Be considerate. Even in great pain. Because he was full of joy. Yeah, and someone who is full of joy, if a Christian is full of joy, amen. Now, I love that song you guys sung this morning. That, that, this was not planned, was it? Because I wanted to read these verses out. It says, in Galatians 5.22, it says, God's Spirit makes us loving, happy, peaceful, patient, kind, good, and faithful, gentle, and self-controlled. Okay? So when we come to church, we're full of joy, and that joy is expressed by consideration in our speech. Do I hear an amen to that? Amen. Now, I've got to be careful what I say now, don't I? Okay? Because I'm, I'm, I'm guilty of being sarcastic from time to time, and sarcasm can hurt people, so I've got to be careful sometimes. I mean, it's just that dry New Zealand sense of humour that I've got. But I've got to consider it. Amen? It should be right. It's not always a problem. No, it's not. It won't be right, okay? <laughs> Last one. I'm going to finish on this. Jealousy produces conflict, but joy produces care. That's, that's not right. What I wanted to say was, jealousy produces fighting, doesn't it? But joy will always produce faith. Come on. Isn't that right? Joy will always produce faith. Yeah. Now these Jews, these jealous Jews, it says in Acts 13, 45, they insulted Paul and spoke against everything that he said. Looking for conflict. Looking for a fight. Because that's what jealous people do. Looking for contradictions. And you know, there is a story in the Bible of a man called Isaac. He was Abraham's son. And he was somebody who had God's favor on his life. There was a famine in the land of Canaan. He wanted to follow his father's example and go down to Egypt. Abraham did that. didn't work out for him. But he, he, he wanted to go down there. God spoke to him specifically. He said, don't go to Canaan, but rather go to a place called, just stay here. He ended up going to a place called Gerar, which was where the Philistines were. And when he was in this place called Gerar, God blessed him exponentially. And the Bible says in Genesis 26, 13, he was so successful, he became very rich. But the locals got jealous. And they expressed their jealousy by picking a fight with him. And it says in verse 14, it says, The Philistines were jealous of the large number of sheep and goats and slaves that Isaac owned. And verse 15 says, They stopped up the wells that Abraham's servants had dug before his death. Now these wells belong to Jacob because Abraham had dug them. And because of Isaac being the son of Abraham, he had the right to, to, to access the water from these wells. But instead, these shepherds, these local shepherds, because they were jealous of Isaac's success, they came along and said, we'll fix you. We'll sort you out, mate. And they got a few shovels out, got a few pickaxes, and they just put a whole lot of dirt, and they, and they stopped the well up. Looking for a fight. Looking for conflict. And the Bible says when, when, they, when they filled in one particular well, it says in verse 21, it says, Isaac's servant stuck another well. The sheep, the sheep also quarrel about that, that well as well and say, this belongs to us. So that well was named Jealous. Conflict and fighting is always a characteristic, a sign that somebody is jealous. Now, they were jealous. Now, the Bible says in James, you get double barrels this morning, aren't you? I'm not preaching for about three weeks, so, you know, aren't you? So I'm making the most of my opportunity. But the Bible says in James chapter 4, verse 1, and James was writing to Christians here. He says, why do you fight and argue with each other? Isn't it because you are full of selfish desires that fight to control your body? You want something you don't have and will do anything to get it. You will even kill, but you still cannot get what you want. And you don't get it by fighting and arguing. This is what you should be doing, guys. Come on. Don't fight with somebody because they have something you don't. But pray. Yeah. Pray about it. Show up in a faith. It's a much better alternative to fighting. Isn't that right? Yeah. Much better alternative. 
Have faith that God will give you your own victories. I've seen too many churches, they fight with the local church down the road because the local church is doing better than they are. And so they get jealous. And because they get jealous, they want to start fighting them, saying how bad they are. And saying, well, you, you know, the only reason you've been successful is because you've been worldly. And that may be the case on some occasions, but not every time. Sometimes God just chooses to bless yeah, the church. And, and if God chooses to bless the church up the road, if God chooses to bless the, the, the Anglicans down the road, or the Presbyterian, or the Church of Christ, or, or anybody else, then we'll, we will, we'll be thankful. I mean, as long as that's the best performance, okay? <laughs> but we're going to have faith that God is going to give us our own victories. Amen, yes. And our own church. Amen. And we'll pray about it. Yes, Lord. Now I want to just give a just give a quick story before I close. Maybe get the musicians up here. We are going to we are to play play a video afterwards that I think is really really good. But we can just get guys just you can, maybe you can play that, that that song we sung before that new one that that was really good. But I'm just going to tell a quick story and then I'm going to close. You know, in my younger days, in my days of, of wandering. Well, three years of wandering from going to Bible school to actually getting out there on the mission field. I played for the local rugby team. The mighty Epping Cavaliers. Down at some of the local on Blacksland Road, that was where I was every Saturday and I played for the local football team. I played with my, with my brother. It was a great, great experience. And one day we had to play the Blacktown Workers Club. And the guys from Blacktown were bigger and uglier than we were. And we thought, you know, and they were, they were winning the competition, they were undefeated. And they said, and, you know, and, and all, we, we were thinking as these boys from Epping, we can't beat these boys from Black Town, they're too big for us. And they had a really good kicker, and he was really good at gaining tens of meters of territory with just one kick. But our coach, he got us together before the game in practice and he said look I've got a plan guys I've got a plan and if we play this plan to perfection yeah. we will win I promise you have faith we will win and I was what they call a flanker it was my job to harass the back line for those of you who know anything about football to harass the opposition and he said Mick Hennessy he used to call me Mick because all Australians call me Mick for some reason. He said, Everyone's called me Mike, but the Aussies call me Mick. And he said, Michael, if, as long as you just harass the guy who's, who's a good kicker, we will win the game. Frustrate him. And we will have victory. And sure enough, on a really windy, cold Saturday afternoon, I did that for 80 minutes. So much so, I was sick afterwards. I just gave my all for this, for this football team. And, and I got home on the flu because it was windy, it was cold, but I just obeyed my coach's instructions. The other guy on the other side of the scrum, he did the same thing. And we had a victory. We had a victory. Even though we didn't have the plane stop, the other team did. Because we had faith in our coach and we followed his instructions, God gave us victory. Amen. Someone else has got something better than you, and you might see some, some something that someone else has. Maybe someone drives to church or should in a nice car, and you think, oh, you might go to somebody's house. You might see a nice house. What about an invitation to your house, Jerusha? Soon. And how long is soon? A few weeks. Okay. We longer than that. Come on, longer than that. Come on. I might go to Jerusha's house and she had a spick and span looking really nice, and I can look at here and look what she has and what I've got. I think just had a bit of a wind and a mumble to myself. Start picking out all the problems in it. Picking out all the all the faults in the building. Say, so just because I'm jealous. But I'm not going to do that. Because I choose faith over fighting. Amen? Yeah. And I believe God can give me my victories. Amen? Jealousy produces comparisons. Careless speech and fighting. Joy produces contentment, consideration, and faith.
faith. What are you going to choose today? Everybody watch on YouTube. What are you going to choose today? The song we're going to sing. Just detail the fruits of the Spirit. When you do choose to give your life to Christ, when you do choose, amen, to follow Him, your portion, your possession, is a greater capacity to love, a greater capacity to joy, an inner strength that is not dictated to you by circumstances, a greater capacity to have peace, a greater capacity to have patience, even in the workshop, Kingy, when you sharpen a knife and you cut your finger again. I mean, all those things, yes. Patience to be co workers. <laughs> but, it all, but it all starts when you make a choice, don't you? To choose joy. Amen. And to choose Him over the alternative. So we're just going to stand this morning and we're just going to pray a prayer. And if this you this morning, then maybe you feel a little bit jealous lately. That's all right. Forgive you. God will forgive you. But just today, amen, we're going to choose joy. Amen. We're going to follow this path, this trail for us. Amen. So just pray this prayer after me out loud. Amen. Just for the benefit of those who want you on Zoom or whatever else. If you want to pray along, pray along. Lord Jesus, we come to you today. We thank you, Lord, for all the fruits of the Spirit. And we thank you, Lord, that one of the fruits of the Spirit is joy. And Lord, we choose joy over jealousy today. We choose not to compare. We choose to be content. We choose not to be inconsiderate with our speech. But we choose to be considerate. Lord, we choose not to fight and to be hostile and to get into conflict. But Lord, we choose to have faith in you. Always. In Jesus' precious, precious name. Watching the nightly news Don't seem to find the rhythm Just wanna sing the blues Feels like a song that never Stops Feels like it's never gonna Gotta get that fire Fire back in my bones Before my heart Heart turns into stone So when somebody please Pass the megaphone I'll shout it on the count of three
that joy, 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 joy down in my heart, down in my heart to stay. Joy down in my heart, down in my heart to stay.